This topic is huge. How do you work and have a career and actually advance in your career even though you have PTSD symptoms from childhood? Past trauma can really block your ability to handle yourself and take the necessary actions that anyone needs to take if they're going to pursue a professional dream that involves staying productive and working with other people, which frankly can be hard for us. Because just about all jobs and all professional accomplishments involve that productivity and connecting with people. So here are some major areas that I recommend you work on healing so that you can enjoy and advance in your career. All right, number one, you'll need to heal the tendency to wear the harshness of your past or of the present, like on your sleeve. Do you know that saying, like you just show it to the world? So you wouldn't want to be talking about the past all the time. You wouldn't want to be using it as your identity or bragging about it. Like it was so bad for me, everybody. I know very well how this can be a problem because I grew up like welfare poor and I had parents who were incredibly brilliant. My mom, my dad, my stepdad, the problems in the family, mostly stemming from alcoholism actually in some of the members, it absolutely crushed my parents' lives. They were all highly educated, but they were frustrated. We were poor most of the time and there was a world of trouble and grief because of their struggle. And that's the background where I grew up. And like so many of you, I was determined that I would never be like them. I would be different. And in some ways I was, I didn't become an alcoholic probably through no great virtue, but because of luck of the genetic draw, I was a great student. I was intelligent, but mostly I didn't have any supervision from parents. So when it was time to go to college, I had no idea how to go there. I walked into the admissions office at the University of Arizona in August of the year after I got out of high school and I found out for the first time that you were supposed to apply and that you needed to take the SAT test. So that first semester, I went to community college and I cleaned houses to support myself. In the spring semester, I got into the U of A, but I had no idea how the whole thing worked or how I was supposed to support myself. You know, and eventually I figured it out. I became a good student. And if that's all it took to have a good career, I would have been fine. But my problems went way beyond education. I had terrible self-esteem and I had trouble dealing with people. I was always in conflicts. Well, not always, but often in conflicts. And I'd make some new best friends and then the friendships would blow up. And this happened in my romantic life too, which really damaged the energy that I brought to work. And so these are some of the ways that people with trauma can wear their past on their sleeve. It, it, it just comes with you into the job. Another way that you could be wearing it on your sleeve, not that you mean to, but maybe you dress too shabbily. Maybe that your the way you dress reflects low self-esteem or poverty consciousness. And it's not your fault that you grew up poor and most people in the world are poor, but if you're trying to move up in the world, you know, the it's just really good advice that you would wanna dress the part. And so putting energy into that, maybe you didn't learn it at home, but it's a good thing to do now. Another thing in, this, in that category of wearing your trauma on your sleeve is uh, it's time to become mindful about how much you disclose to people about yourself, not just about your past and the trauma and, you know, oh, I was abused. You don't necessarily wanna bring that out very early in a friendship with somebody but also self-disclosing about, um, you know, what's going on at home right now or how much traffic there was or how sick you are or what the symptoms were because I wasn't very consciously parented. My parents knew how to act with people, I think, but I was sort of feral and I didn't know and I would often go to work and I would just be talking about problems and how much I resented people in the office and I was just, you know, I was just, I was sort of an open book but not in a good way and it stigmatized me. So another thing would be, you kind of almost brag about how bad things used to be in the past, just so that people will think that you're interesting or worthy, right? There's, there's an element in our culture where we sort of, we make victims into heroes only because they were victims. And it is heroic. It's a big deal to come up from a difficult past and to be working in a job. But it's appropriate to measure out how much you say about what that past is and not try to wear it like a badge of honor. 
um, all by itself. You know, you still, just like everybody there, you kind of have to prove yourself. You have to learn skills, you have to get along with people, and you have to get things done. That's kind of what jobs generally expect, right? All right, so the second big area, a big trauma symptom area that you're going to need to heal to succeed at work is to deal with a, the tendency to underfunction. Now, some of us are overfunctioners and some are underfunctioners. And, and, and I'll tell you what exactly that is in a minute, but people who overfunction, who do too much, who like stay too late, or burn the midnight oil, burn themselves out, get really mad later that nobody reciprocated how much they're putting into a job or a relationship or something. With overfunctioning, there's often the big productivity crash that comes along and you know, you can't, you can't stay with it. So you set this expectation, hey, I can do everything. I'm heroic. And, and then you can't. Underfunctioning is sometimes the consequence of overfunctioning for a period of time. Or for some people, it's just like their basic speed. So underfunctioning includes things like having a really hard time focusing for a long period of time, you know, being restless at work, um, jumping on the internet, just can't really, uh, you know, can't really focus enough, being unreliable not showing up on time for things where people were counting on you, or even worse, lying about the fact that you did it or make, you know, making up a fake story about why you didn't show up on time, or not even admitting that you did. <laughs> there's like lying and then there's pretending that it's not a problem, you know, if you didn't show up for something where people were counting on you. Personally, that's my pet peeve. I don't like it when people lie or don't admit. Like it's, if they just say, I made a mistake, <laughs> I'm like, all right, I make mistakes, I get it. But if they're just like, yeah, but it was because of, you know, traffic or something. And I'm like, I drove here too, I know it's not traffic. Or they just don't even acknowledge, sorry, I'm late. Here's a little trick, by the way. When you come into a business meeting and you did have to be late, instead of coming in, this is, it's very disruptive for the meeting. When you come in late to a meeting and people are already working, a person whose trauma is just hanging all over them comes in and goes, Hey, I'm here. Oh my God, the traffic. Oh, I was trying to get here. And I thought, Oh, and I was going to call, but I couldn't call. And uh, That energy is really disruptive and calls a lot of attention to the fact that you're late. Here's what you can do when you're late. You come in very quietly, just don't let the door bang, you know, be quiet and come in and say, sorry, I'm late and sit down, get out something to write on and start paying attention. You need not explain. If somebody asks you, maybe you can explain. Personally, I recommend experimenting with telling the truth about things. It holds you accountable for what's going on and allows you to make some positive changes in your life. All right, the third big symptom area of childhood PTSD that needs to be healed for you to succeed at work is a tendency to feel overwhelmed, like so overwhelmed that you can't even begin. You can't begin the work. Now I get this, I get very overwhelmed. That's a PTSD thing I have. And I have a whole system. I have a morning routine that helps me start the day with a one foot in front of the other approach rather than just a big, oh, the day, the day. I wake up like that. It's like an emotional flashback. My emotional flashbacks, that's a trauma thing. They're like this. I wake up and I'm like, it's been going on like in my dreams at night. I have dysregulation dreams even. And so I wake up sometimes in all this distress. It's like, oh, I have so much to do. I have so much to do. And why is it me? Why is it me? I have to do everything. So that's an emotional flashback. When I start thinking that, if I don't stop it and start using my tools to come back and go, I don't have to do everything. I only have to do it one thing at a time. I can only do them, uh, you know, in a certain order. I'm going to make a list of what that order is and the best I can and start tackling it. To do that, I start with my morning routine, which always begins, I go get something to drink and I do my daily practice. And that's a specific writing technique followed by a specific meditation technique. Very simple, shockingly effective to help move that emotional flashbacky mind, those distressed hamster wheel thoughts of like, oh my God, I gotta do so much, I gotta do so much. That's, how, that's the shape that my complex PTSD takes. And untreated, it just turns me into a nervous wreck who's angry, who's ineffective, who's isolated because those, the angry and angry part is very offensive to other people. So instead, I make room in my mind for inspiration, creativity, ideas, and action by using these techniques. And if you ever want to learn those, they're always below all my videos, the daily practice. It's a free course. I think something like half a million people have taken it now. And that makes me so happy because it's really helpful. And the only way to find out if it helps you is to try it. So 
the overwhelm um, begins with I get my mind in order with the racing thoughts and get the fearful and resentful thoughts out of my mind and onto paper. When I'm done with my daily practice, I take a shower, I go get my breakfast, and then I sit down and I work my to-do list. And I use an online tool for that. Lots of people have different ones. I use this thing called Kanban Flow, K-A-N-B-A-N Flow. It's, um, it's a free app, although I have a paid version. It's $5 a month or something. And it's a little structure where I can click and drag tasks into columns and I color code them and I plan each day of what I'm going to do. And I always put way too much in. And then at the end of the day, I can move them over into the next day or sort of rearrange the tasks ahead of me. And I love this tool. It's got a little timer built in and I can, it'll say, I click the timer. It says, click on a task and I go, oh, I'm going to you know, prep the intros to five videos or something. So I put that and I time that like five videos. That's like an hour and a half for me, right? If I, if I already know what the letters are, I've picked the letters, but I'm going to prepare the introductions and sort of think through and what's the, what's the download I'm going to recommend at the end. I put some thought into that. Okay. Hour and a half, hour and a half for me is this like green color. <laughs> half an hour is yellow. <laughs> And two hours is blue. So I have the whole color system of how long something takes. And then I can sort of see my day. But I click on the task I'm going to do. And then I start a timer. And I've got my timer set at 25 minutes. It's called the Pomodoro method. Pomodoro is the Italian word for tomato. And legend has it, the person who invented this technique um, was using a timer shaped like a tomato. Pomodoro. <laughs> and, and I do that 25 minutes. So uh, like sometimes I try to freelance it and just get productive all by myself without a timer. And sometimes I am, and sometimes I'm not. I get very, you know, I work on a computer and also on my computer is this very interesting thing called the internet. And it's, hard to resist going in there and go, oh, what's happening on YouTube today? How's the stats there? What are the comments and Twitter and, and, you know, Facebook? Oh, somebody wants something. And next thing you know, I can't even remember what I intended to work on, literally. And you probably have the same thing. Like, I'm not being shocking here. I have that. I don't have ADHD. I'm very capable of focusing, but I need tools. And so setting a timer, it goes off after 25 minutes and I shut down tabs. I shut down notifications for that period of time. And I just do that thing for 25 minutes. And it's in, it's really powerful if I can get started with a set of tasks that way. Being able to get things done is my superpower. I, I have so many like CPTSD traits that make it hard, but the reason I've been able to make a living in my life mostly, and certainly for the past 23 years, as a self-employed person, it's because I'm really good. I, I can see what needs to be done and I can do it. And I used to do it for clients and now I do it for Crappy Childhood Fairy. And I just have this very honed ability to go in and go, let's see, where are we? Where are we trying to get? What do we need to do? I have a, a big picture view of things. I'm good at that, analytical thinking. And people have different strengths and that's that one's one of mine. So I can see what to do. And I used to be very helpful to my um, consulting clients because I'd look at a project and then I would think through, here's where we need to be, here's what you need to do. And I would send them an email with this beautiful list of questions and action items. And that's like my dream is that I have somebody like me who helps me do that now that I'm always like, you know, out there leading crappy childhood fairy. So staying organized, it's not late. It's not natural to me because of my trauma. And I'm very good at it because of my ability to use tools. That's what I'm trying to get at. So that's overwhelm as something that keeps a person in under functioning. Another one is a tendency to favor doing grunt work, work for which you're gravely overqualified rather than going for more challenging or higher paid roles because you get so triggered that your CPTSD symptoms come out that trying to stick your neck out or try something hard for you is too much. You can learn to bring that back down, but that's a sign that you're under functioning. If you're doing work where you're like, people don't even have any idea, like I don't belong here, but we put ourselves there. We will often perceive ourselves as having no choice, but I'm, I'm making this video to try to talk to that part of you that knows that deep down inside there is a choice and it might take some preparation and some courage and some work on healing your CPTSD symptoms so you can do it. But with more healing, you can take greater risks and put yourself out there and do the sort of job that you really can do, the, the one that gives you joy and that pays adequately. I want that for everybody. All right. Another way that we underfunction is not asking for what we want. Do you do that? Where 
instead of saying, hey, you know what, uh, I want to have a promotion or I want to stop working in this part of the company and I want to work in that one or I don't want to deal with this unpleasant person anymore. And we just think, oh, I have to put up with this. I can't, you know, make a fuss because again, I can't deal with how triggered I get around it. You might not even be consciously having that thought, but if you can't manage your CPTSD triggers and you get dysregulated and upset about things that set off your nervous system into CPTSD symptoms, you have to make your life small. Everything depends on learning to calm your triggers, not trying to make everybody else not trigger you. You can never really make that happen, but learning to calm your response to triggers until they're barely even triggers anymore. And then your life starts getting a lot bigger. That's under-functioning. The thing about over-functioning, the opposite is like doing things for other people that they can do for themselves, trying to do more than your share, trying to prove yourself to the boss by like, look, I did 27 things for you instead of the one thing you asked. The problem with that is that if it's not rewarded, which it usually wouldn't be if it's not asked for, maybe, I don't know, but if it's not rewarded, it goes into resentment. The over-functioning isn't like a genuine expression of yourself. It's a strategy to dance around and try to get somebody to like you and think you're good enough. So that's also like a CPTSD symptom to do that. We don't want to either overfunction or underfunction. There's a time for each, like in vacation, maybe you underfunction. When there's a big deadline, you overfunction, but you don't want to be a person who's stuck in one gear or the other. All right. The third area of CPTSD symptoms that can really get in the way of your career growth is getting dysregulated on the job. Now you can learn to re-regulate and it will make all the difference. And I can just like that has been my experience and it was very quick that I began to change when I learned to identify that I was dysregulated and I used my tools to re-regulate. And again, that's the daily practice course I teach. It's down in the description section. I recommend that you take this need to master re-regulation very seriously. If you get dysregulated, and by dysregulated, I mean a nervous system reaction to stress that people with trauma often get, which leads you to feel discombobulated, numb, emotionally kind of on a roller coaster, like your anger is too much or your sadness is too much or you're too excited about something. It's emotional dysregulation. If you get sick a lot, a lot of chronic diseases with no origin, that could be dysregulation. Inability to focus or learn, uh, inability to read the room, like you walk in and you can't really tell what's going on with people. All of that can be dysregulation. And dysregulation has now turned out to be the core symptom that drives so many other trauma symptoms. So if you get dysregulated, you have everything to gain by learning to re-regulate and mastering it on the job and outside of the job. Dysregulation is the reason why you may be getting those productivity crashes where you get some sort of accomplishment, you put yourself out there, you get some accolades or, and then, you know, somebody says one little critical word and zoom, you go back down. Dysregulated people are really capable of accomplishing things, but they have a harder time sustaining just kind of a steady, progress. There's these crashes of productivity. And if you have those, you may have been trying to hide them on the job, pretending you're sick, not really knowing what's wrong. Before I had healing for my complex PTSD, I would say when something really good happened or I got recognized for something, a promotion or, you know, in my personal life, like somebody I really liked asked me out, something like that. I could have a productivity crash for three days easily. And to this day, if I get really, really upset about something, I can have another productivity crash. If I get dysregulated badly, I, it takes a certain amount of time to recover my re-regulation. So if you, and this is after 29 years of having skills for this, you can think of how it used to be for me. I mean, I just went months where I could barely read a paragraph. I would read it over and over again. I was faking it. Once I was a passenger in a car and I, I had a cup of coffee, like a ceramic mug in my hand, and I can't remember what I was talking about with somebody, but what they said made me mad. And I just threw the cup out the window and the cup smashed. And I remember they pulled the car out over and they started crying. It was so upsetting to them. And I was so dysregulated that I didn't predict that that would even affect them, that I smashed a cup out the window. It was just this weird, reckless, rough thing to do. And not coincidentally, it was something that my parents used to do is like break dishes when they were upset. It was in there. So through my daily practice and through re-regulation, I've started to kind of let those old imprints of how to deal with feelings and 
you know, lashing out like that, but it started to be rinsed off of me and washed downstream in the experience of my life. And then a new strength comes up inside where I have some balance and some calm inside to draw on when things are rough and things get rough sometimes. Getting dysregulated at work can also cause you to sort of come off as hostile and intimidating and difficult. And <laughs> unfortunately, if you have CPTSD and it's active and you haven't yet developed a way to sort of do a self-examination and get some support from somebody who totally cares about you, like maybe a buddy in my daily practice program or a sponsor in 12 steps, somebody you trust to sort of, when you can go, is it just me? Like, should I be really angry right now? It really helps to get a second opinion from trusted people because if you're coming off as very, very difficult, even if people are obliged by law to treat you fairly, it's not fair to them that they would have to work with somebody who's causing so much anxiety. So I'm just going to ask you to look at it that way. It's very difficult to work with somebody who's leading with anger, who's leading with conflict, who's getting emotionally dysregulated on the job and sort of triggering and drawing off of the, the peaceful well that anybody else has managed to develop. The best way forward, if a job is really terrible and it makes you so angry all the time because it's a bad place for you to work, I encourage you to change jobs. Like nobody's coming to save you on this. If you want to work in a better environment, it is time for you to start putting your ducks in a row so you can make that change. And if you're choosing to stay in the environment, you may need to assess as difficult things happen, you know, wait a minute, you know, am I being mistreated here? Should I just let it go? Should I just show up and be a good sport? Like these are the improvisational decisions that we make day after day after day, especially when we're out in the world dealing with people. As you heal your dysregulation, you'll have good judgment about it. You'll have good judgment and you'll have equanimity, magnanimity. This is where you can be just sort of like, kind and easy going with people when they're edgy with you. And often you can be the one who sort of heads off a big conflict of just like, we're cool. Okay. Not being a doormat. There's, it's a fine line, isn't it? And this is where people with uh, childhood PTSD can get so jammed up is there is a conflict. Somebody's not being quite right. They're off in some way. You need to set a boundary. You want to be kind about it. You don't want to be a doormat. And this is where we get very confused. So again, I recommend daily practice to help move the stress thoughts downstream so you can have clear thoughts and lucid decisions about like what to do about the little things that happen every day. And you will be surprised what a, how quickly your life goes from a trajectory that's kind of uh, not going that well to a trajectory that is going so much better because of these little decisions along the way. The little decisions where you kind of handle it, you handle it. You're the reliable person. You're the sturdy person. You're the person with boundaries who says no to mistreatment without a big bunch of fireworks about it. It's just a boundary. I remember I used to run a video production company and I meditate every day, twice a day. And one of those meditations is somewhere around four or five in the afternoon. And when you do video production, sometimes you can't, you know, the schedule demands that you keep working quite long into the evening. But I knew, and I had the privilege because I owned the company of just like, I need to meditate or I'm going to start getting grumpy, unfocused, hostile, intimidating, you know, all those things. And I know that I do that in it and it brings me back into, you know, lucidity and kind of a, a, a goodness of heart and a clear mind. And that's exactly how I want to be doing all my work always. And so I would just be like about five o'clock, I'm going to have us all take a break. I'm going to go meditate. And I set a boundary on that. And people were just like, okay, Anna has to meditate. And I had spent years missing my evening meditation when I was working because I was afraid that I couldn't ask for it or I couldn't try it. And so I just put that out there. You may not own your company right now or have that privilege, but you might be surprised that when you set boundaries in a way that's not um, trying to put any responsibility on other people, but just like going, I have this thing I need to do. It's now nine in the morning. And when it gets to be that time, I'm going to need a break to do that. So are we good? Are we good? And then maybe you need to be a little flexible about it, but you get to do the things that help you stay in the frame of mind where you can advance in your career and not just that's because I'll tell you at five o'clock, if I'm not writing and meditating and the stress of video production, if I didn't do it, 
I turned into the kind of person who did not get another job from the client. I'll say that. <laughs> so it became totally important that I care for myself. Anyway, it surprised me. People were very glad for me to take care of myself. And not only did they tolerate it, but they respected me for it. They started asking me, so how do you meditate? Where did you learn to do that? Like it became intriguing to them that somebody took care of themselves right in front of them. All right, a sub area again of dysregulation on the job is it makes it very hard to deal with criticism and there's just no way around it. Like if you're going to grow on the job, you have to be open to some level of people telling you how you maybe made a mistake or how you need to do it better. It can also make you vague about discussions of money. It's easy to walk into a job and go, um, so, yeah, I'd like to do the job and then be like, oh, I should have asked for how much money. I just have no idea. And if you are not somebody who can be comfortable talking about money and own what it is you require, then you are very unlikely to get what you want or deserve. And so dysregulation makes that sort of decision to be able to be honest about what it is you're looking for and not, not playing any games, but just saying, I need to be paid this much or this job isn't going to work for me. To be able to do that with peace in your heart is what re-regulation looks like. And not to be like, oh, I'm all, I'm preemptively so angry. I never get what I want. You know, oh, here we go. I'm not, oh no, I can't say anything. It's going to come out wrong. It's stupid. I don't, oh, fine. I'll just not say anything. You don't want to be that person. The other thing that you can get very vague about that can really create problems on the job and dysregulation, this is a big way that dysregulation sabotages people, is you get vague about sexual boundaries. So if you are getting sexually harassed, or let's say that a coworker and you have, you know, an attraction going and you're hanging out after work and you don't really know, like, is this a date? Is this an attraction? Is this okay at work? Um, are we going to talk about this? All that stuff. To get vague about it at work is so shooting yourself in the foot. Work is a place where you need to be very, very clear about where you're coming from and you need to be clear where other people are coming from. And I know that it is a tricky dance to be able to clarify these things, that you could really put people on the spot, you could make them feel threatened, maybe you're not ready to do that yet. But I urge you, do not get vague about your boundaries, about sex, attraction, hanging out with people who you think maybe are hitting on you. That is some place to say, and this is where being re-regulated helps. You can just say, oh, thanks. This feels like a date. I wouldn't want to do that. You can say it in the nicest way so that if there's any hope that you can set your boundary without the other person freaking out, which is what bad people do, right? When they're confronted with boundaries, it happens at work, obviously. But if you possibly can, you set your boundaries in the nicest possible way so that you're not part of any conflict. And most people will say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's not where I was coming from. And the whole thing evaporates. Even in your personal life, if you have vague and confusing relationships with people where you're like, is this a date or is this kind of, are we flirting? Is it, are you cheating on your spouse? Like what's going on here? where you don't know, there's a magic power that you always have with you and it's honesty. When there's like magic pixie dust all over everything, like, I don't know, we're just not gonna say anything about what's really going on here because it will ruin the moment or I'll feel embarrassed or then you'll know or it'll become obvious that this is not sustainable. Like those are things that we do when we have trauma wounds. This is also what people do in limerence is keep it vague, keep it vague because to have it be concrete would be to have it be something that you must say no to. It's not real. It's not legitimate. You will get rejected. So, so we keep it vague and we get too good at that. But that is the kind of thing that will bite you in the butt at work. You do not want to be vague about these things. The ideal scenario though, is where you hold your boundaries at work. You don't get too into it with people. If you have to explain yourself, you're already losing your boundary. If you have to, you can go to your support people outside of work to process the emotions and have a cry and deal with all the feelings that come up around it. The fourth trauma zone that can come and hold back your advancement at work is the other people in your life. Um, usually it would be a partner who are just messed up enough to sabotage the impression you make at work. And that could be everything from the controlling and abusive partner at home. It could be people who continue to have drama in their own life and you get calls all the time and you have to take them to the emergency room. Or 
you have a home life that you invest a lot of energy into hiding from people at work and that may be appropriate but when it's draining your energy all the time of what's going on at home you know maybe you have a partner with an addiction maybe you have a marriage that's falling apart maybe you have a kid who's in great difficulty and i know how complicated those situations can be but i i would be leaving something big out if i didn't acknowledge that having troubled people in your home life can sabotage you at work. So I hope you can do everything you need to do to have a little bit of separation from that. Um, coming to work with what I call an emotional hangover. You know, I never was much of a drinker, but I would get into such emotional scrapes and difficulties with people that I would come to work late with a terrible migraine, looking awful, having cried all night, eyes all puffy. And it was functionally, I had to admit, like being an alcoholic, like being an alcoholic with a hangover. And it used to happen too much because of the kinds of relationships that I had before I had trauma healing and when I still didn't know how to get re-regulated. One of the, oh gosh, it's just such a relief now in post-healing life. I, I talk about it like it's all done. I mean, so much progress. Luckily, it continues, so I don't even know where it's going next. But I wake up in the morning every day, okay. <laughs> and it's a, it's, it's a great asset to being able to um, open up my heart and my life to new opportunities and things that are hard for me. Like everything that I've ever done as crappy childhood fairy, at some point it was new, like putting my first video up on YouTube. It took so much courage. And um, I'm working on a book now and I have an agent and trying to do all of that is like, again, like it takes courage. I could never do it if I had an emotional hangover as often as I used to. So that's another reason. Like so many people with complex PTSD, my early career looked a lot like a roller coaster with great accomplishments and then big descents, giving up, quitting things, crashing and burning. And it wasn't just productivity, but it had a lot to do with people who I chose as partners. And twice I ended up with, with men who had active, serious drug addictions. In both cases, I didn't realize it at first. In, uh, one of them had a relapse after a couple years into the relationship. One of them had been secretly using the whole time. And it was absolutely devastating to, to my career both times. Both times, my career derailed. It was very stigmatizing to me. There was no way I could continue to hide it. We're talking serious drugs and terrible consequences of what happened to them. When I started to have boundaries about who got into my life, which involved making a decision that it was okay with me if I was single forever, a single mom at that point, I would be single forever, but I would never again have that level of drama of an active addict in my life. My career couldn't help but go up because I stopped having this crazy intense drama going on all the time. And so if you've never had a drama-free life and been able to go to work like that with your own optimism or energy, or maybe you don't like the job that day, but just to basically have your wits and your emotions in their little cubby holes <laughs> when you arrive at work, you're gonna be so pleasantly surprised how much energy and bandwidth you have that's all for you to be able to accomplish what you want. It's fantastic. That is one of the gifts of healing. All right, a fifth way trauma area that will stop you from getting ahead at work is choosing jobs and bosses who match your terrible family of origin, right? How many times have you done that? Like constantly brings out the worst in you when you do that. Like you may be able to get a lot of healing with your parent, but there's a reason why we get some distance from those toxic dynamics. And if you're not healed yet, you will have a tendency to choose bosses and coworkers and work environments that have some sort of like mimicking yuckiness about them, like what you you grew up with. So for me, I would say the bosses, I, I've had some good bosses. I haven't had a boss in like 23 years, but I had clients. And one of the hardest things that I kept getting into was clients or bosses with significant drinking problems like my mom, drugs and alcohol problems. And I get around that energy and it's like kryptonite where I feel very angry. I feel shut down. I feel very snippy. I'm not pleasant and I'm not very visionary, and it's, it ends up using up about 60% of my vital force, you know, just to cope with somebody who's high. And it's not good for me. I don't want to be around it. I, it's just one of those things I had to make a conscious decision. I will not work with people who I feel are drunk or high, and ugh, so many bad memories there. 
And the other thing, the other negative tendency that I um, would tend to gravitate towards is bosses who really underestimated me. Now, being a consultant is nice. When you're freelancing, they think highly enough of you to employ you, and it may not last forever. You may not get a second job with them, but if it's spread out a little bit, you get to really like work on your professional skills without falling into a, a parent-child relationship with your boss. And I think there's a subtle way of doing that. I sometimes, I get letters from people or I've coached people where they're like, my boss invalidates me, you know, my boss plays favorites and I'm just like, oh, bad situation, bad situation. Sometimes I think the only thing for it is to get out of a job like that. Sometimes healing is possible, but if you're dealing with a dynamic that you grew up with and you're not very far along your, your path of healing your trauma symptoms, being around the stuff that hurt you in the first place can just really take you down. So I recommend making a conscious decision about the kind of boss and coworkers that would be good for you and seeking it out and being willing to take the time to find that. And I know, I mean, look, I started in this video telling you I had to clean houses while I was young, you know, just to get by. I, I've had all kinds of jobs that were hard and that I just had to do for money. And I know, I know it's like that, but we're all, we're all hoping for something a little better, right? We want to get on to where we feel fulfilled, where we're using our talents and gifts, where we're getting paid well enough to be financially okay. That's a very nice thing to have. It feels good to do the absolute best job you can do. And um, one way, one thing that comes as a shock to people is that when you're in a job and you work for a boss or a company or a project, your job is to make that entity, that person, that organization, that group as successful as you can. So when you're in a, like a parent dynamic with the parent who hurt you, your objective becomes something very different than you know making them successful. And that may sound very self-sacrificing to you, it's not. When you make your boss successful, you rise up. If your boss doesn't recognize that that's valuable and reward you, either it's not a place that has a, has a better place for you, or it's not a place that's willing to give that to you, and that's not a good environment. So if I had my whole career to do over again, and what I tell my coaching clients is, be brave about envisioning a step forward, a step up, a step out. And if you can't get it from where you are right now, then you have to do the very triggering and dysregulating act of finding something new and quitting the old job. But you can now do that without a big conflict or fireworks or rancor, that it's just a positive step that people take and it's okay and you deserve it. And when you learn to master re-regulation from your dysregulation, it becomes natural. Be sure you surround yourself with people who get it, that you have people with whom you can be honest. At first I had this in 12-step uh, programs, then I started to have it around people who had complex PTSD. And that's one thing I love about our membership program is like everybody's working on this stuff. Everybody's kind of working off the same playbook about how to do it. Everybody's hopping on Zoom together. Our members create their own Zoom calls to do the daily practice together. They have buddy relationships. Anyway, I was turning into an ad for that. But if you really wanted to be around people who are walking this path of improving their lives, come check it out. Uh, there's a link always down below in the description section for my membership program or on my website. So with that, I wish you well. I wish you every bit of freedom from the oppression and suppression of the past, what people did to you, and the ways that you've held yourself back since then too. So that the best in you, so that everything you're capable of can come forward and shine. It's not just because that's what will make you happy, it's because we need you. The world depends on all of us becoming our full and real selves and to be able to bring our best to everything we do. If you'd like to take a quick step to launch your healing, I would recommend a free download I have called One Year to Heal. It's a thought exercise. Of course you have more than a year to heal, but if you had to do it in a year, how would you do it? And this is the exercise I've created for you. Click here and I will see you very soon.